Jason Barrett, good morning. Delegate, how are you? I'm doing well, guys. Good morning. Wednesday is your swearing-in day, right? That's right, at noon. At noon. Hi, noon. Will you have any family in town for that? Uh, actually, I will. Um, my parents will be here, and uh, uh, unfortunately, it's it's a little bit of a long trip for my grandmother, who is uh, uh, 92, but she's going to, to watch uh, either on TV or online. So That's awesome, because you will be sworn in as a senator, which is a, a little right. change up. And I, I guess you guys probably, as, as senators, you, you know, you don't have to run for re-election every two years. It's a, You get a, a more deliberative body. You don't have to think about real real short-term solutions you can play things out in the future a bit more um yeah i guess you could say that i mean i you know i like to always take uh you know a very pragmatic approach to to issues and i think i'll continue to do that but but you're right it, it is um there's some comfort knowing that you don't have to be on the ballot in two years and you know it, when you're in the house and you run every two years you um, you, you feel like you're constantly running for re-election. And so this, um, you know, obviously doing the job is far more important than getting the job. So this, this allows more time to actually do the job. So I, I certainly appreciate that. Very nice. Now, do all, are all the senators sworn at the same time or just the new senators? Uh, everyone at noon. Everyone uh, well, at noon. everyone that just was re-elected. Now, now, clearly those that were elected two years sure. ago are not okay. sworn in again. Yeah. They're, okay. they're, they're still in the middle of their term. Yeah. So, Jason, one of the headline stories on the Metro News website uh, from yesterday was in regards to the West Virginia School Service Personnel Association, which is now part of the United Mine Workers of America, and their discussion that pay is their top priority. Now, I know there have been pay raises, I think three of them in the last four years. Their executive director, Joe White, will be looking for another pay raise as well. I'll tell you an anecdotal story about why I think that's necessary and justified. Uh, a, a friend of mine started work as a custodian in Berkeley County Schools recently. He told me his starting pay was, I think, $29,000, which in the Eastern Panhandle, I'm sure you would agree, is difficult to survive on. Now, I don't think you can give them a raise up to $60,000 to start. That, obviously, we don't have the tax base for that. But we, can we agree that twenty nine is probably not the number either? Oh, I, I would certainly agree with that. And, um, you know, I am I think I've said it on the show a couple of times leading up uh, to the beginning of this session, and, and I think during, some, during the campaign, that, you know, if we're going to look at, at additional pay raises for state employees, whether that's teachers, school service personnel, or anyone else, I think the locality pay has to be a component of that, and and I think that's our real shot. Uh, if we're going, if a pay raise is coming, I think that the Eastern Panhandle legislators should really look at the pay raise legislation uh, as the vehicle to to be able to insert some locality pay. And you know, maybe it's time to draw a line in the sand to say that um, okay, we're we're on board with the pay raise, but but now is the time that, that locality pay has to be uh, part of the equation. So I know there are a lot of ways to do the end run on locality pay without calling it locality pay. Is there a particular way that you favor? Uh, not really. I mean, I don't think that there, there's not one way that I'm it's got to be my way or the highway. I think there are, you know, certain aspects of, of just looking at uh a housing allowance, which I'm not particularly in favor of, uh, or, or it's not my preferred method, but, uh, you know, I, I would like for it to just be part of the salary because, as you know, the, the we've talked about several times, you see billboards all over the Eastern Panhandle to tell you what uh, teachers or, or, or law enforcement officers get paid in Washington County, Maryland, or wherever. Uh, it's really hard with to use a housing allowance as part of a, the marketing uh, to attract an employee. You know, it's easy to put a billboard up and say, we're going to start our salary at $45,000. It's harder to say, we're going to start you at thirty five, dollars give you a housing allowance and all these other things. So from a marketing standpoint of, of trying to attract uh, quality employees, I, I think it, it should be part of of the base salary. Um, that obviously comes with a higher fiscal note. And the other part of it that you get some pushback is that it affects retirement. Um, some legislators across the state will tell you that it shouldn't affect the retirement, that the retirement should be the same for employees across the board. Well, my comeback to that is the cost of living doesn't all of, all of a sudden go down for an employee once they retire. I mean, they're still going to, to face that challenge moving forward with with trying to find affordable housing. Um, 
most folks have you know a 30-year mortgage and and you know a lot of folks at, at times have to refinance and and that clearly extends uh their their mortgage term out past their retirement age so uh, you know they're still going to be dealing with those type of issues and um i, I think cost of living adjustment is something that we've we've that the legislature as a whole for, for a number of years uh, probably has dropped the ball, well, I believe dropped the ball on, on giving cost of living uh, adjustments for our retirees. Billy? Yeah, I, I stand with locality pay for just a second, Jason. The unions are against locality pay, but the makeup of both our Senate and legislators, I think, argue for now's the time to get something done. Uh, we have more influence in Charleston than I think we're I'm talking about the eastern panhandle, and if you throw in the northern panhandle as well, probably more influence than we ever have had. Is that one of the reasons you're optimistic that we'll be able to bypass or walk over or uh, bypass the, uh, the influence of the unions in regard to the, uh, uh, to the locality pay? I mean, I think that's a fair characterization, Bill. It, obviously, the unions don't have uh, the amount of support or uh, influence in the legislature that they they once had, uh, they are clearly opposed uh, uh, to locality pay. Um, but you know, also there are members uh, that, and I'm obviously more familiar with the, the, the members of the House, uh, given just joining the Senate. But uh, there are members, there are legislators that. Um, you know, don't agree with the unions at all on any issue, uh, but don't support locality pay. And, I, and I've said for a long time this is more of a, a regional uh, issue than it, than it ever has been uh, one in a partisan nature or, or an ideological nature. It's, it's, it's purely regional. Is it safe to assume that the northern panhandle feels similar to what the eastern panhandle does in terms of locality pay? We always make the assumption that it's the northern panhandle, um, and they ha obviously have concerns. But you look at, at Mon County, which, which may be the, uh, the one with the highest cost of living, uh, or at least the housing cost is, is ranks in the top three or four uh, with the eastern panhandle. So that, that, that's one that we often overlook. Uh, but I think that, that areas like Mon, uh, the north central West Virginia, even though you're not necessarily competing with with out-of-state opportunities uh, because there's a lot of growth in the Clarksburg Bridgeport area uh, their economies are doing well there's a lot of of tech businesses and and those type of things that are that are locating there, opening there there are a lot of opportunities in areas like that I think Putnam County out in in the, the western part of the state is also one that that has some of the issues now, now again they have some competition um, across the state line. So, I mean, there are different pockets uh, across the state, but but certainly the northern panhandle belongs in the conversation. Uh, this is John Gilstrap. Uh, good morning. Hey, John. <clears throat> what can we uh, – my my big issue is broadband access in West Virginia. So what uh, what can we expect from the the Senate and the House, for that matter, in terms of expanding broadband access? Well, I think that there's still a lot of ARPA money that, that should be used uh, for broadband. You know, we talk all the time about um, attracting uh, uh, business to West Virginia, giving uh, business tools to be able to expand uh, the existing businesses here in West Virginia. Uh, we talk about losing population. We talk about trying to uh, attract people to West Virginia. Um, and I think that broadband, you know, always talk about infrastructure, but we have to realize that in the 21st century, broadband is, is really at the top of, of the infrastructure conversation. So, you know, I think that, that the ARPA money needs to be used. I think you need to look at different ways and new technology uh, to be able to expand uh, broadband uh, and, and internet capabilities uh, in rural areas of West Virginia. Do you expect... So I, I, it, it, go ahead. I'm sorry. Are there specific bills or specific strategies to make that happen? Uh, I, I'm not overly familiar. I don't serve on. Uh, I didn't serve on the Technology and Infrastructure Committee uh, in the House. Um, in the next, I don't know that that committee actually exists in the Senate. But um, I, I'm sure there are. Off the top of my head, John, I, I don't know that I have one specific thing uh, other than looking at the new technologies that are that are coming available, um, as opposed to just you know running lines underground. I think there's. I think you're going to look to see some. Uh, some other new technology that allows uh, broadband and, and internet access uh, in a different manner that uh, that will um, provide into those 
areas that that's tough to get um, fiber or those type of things underground too. Gary Wine was on recently, John, and he made reference that there is a lot of uh, money from the governor coming in for broadband. Uh, the, in Berkeley County, the big focus is going to be west of Highway 81. That's where you'll see the first major improvement. Yeah, that would be good news. Hey, Jason, on your first day, Wednesday, you may ask, be asked to vote on some legislation regarding PEIA and reimbursements. Do you know specifically what's been happening there? Yes. <laughs> Thank that's, you. That's right. a short <laughs> next question. <laughs> Moving along, yeah. Can you can you elaborate, Senator Elect? Uh, you know we're the PI, and I, I discussed PI with you guys. I think uh, a couple times here recently. Uh, PI is a is certainly a big issue. It's going to continue to be. It, it's going to be one of the dominating issues, I believe, in, in this session. Um, we're working on on plans to address some of the concerns um, that that. Uh, that hospitals have with PEIA, that uh, those that uh, have PEIA insurance have. So, I mean, we're, we're, I think that you're going to see, um, I think we're going to tackle the PEIA problem as a whole this year. And this seemed to be more on reimbursements than it was in terms of the long-term financial stability of PEIA. Yeah, yeah and I think that, that, that you're hearing about that issue, and that's one of them that we've known uh, has been coming. It's, it's not something that just popped out of thin air, we, we, we saw this coming in the hospital in Wheeling that um, said they're no longer, on July 1st, no longer going to accept uh, PEIA. And, and that's because of they cite the, the reimbursement rates uh, for PEIA is, is below uh, even uh, Medicare and Medicaid in a lot of uh, instances. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a big concern. Um, there are also concerns on the other side that um, the state has been paying far more than the 80-20 match that, that we're obligated to pay. So, you know, there are a lot of things that, that I think go into this, and there are a lot of components to this PA. It's not um, one small issue. It, it's, it's, there are several issues within PIA that, that need addressed, it, and we need to do those collectively, I think. We had Speaker Roger Hanshaw on the program Friday, and Senate President Craig Blair last week was on as well. Craig has talked about the personal income tax and specifically saying unless we're ready to do 50 percent, nothing else is big enough to make an impact from the studies that he's seen. And Speaker Henshaw seemed receptive to that, not all at once, but as he said, more than a year, less than five in terms of phasing in a personal income tax cut of that size. Your thoughts, other than a yes or no answer, on the personal income tax <laughs> and the, 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 the way of getting to 50%, if, if that does seem to be the agreed-upon number between the House and the Senate. So many rules, Rob. Yes. Um, <laughs> it, it's ironic to me that, that the governor uh, said that we could not afford Amendment 2 because it cost $700 million or so, uh, but you know, there's a lot of speculation that he's going to talk about a 50% reduction uh, on the personal income tax, which is greater than a billion dollars. So I'm looking forward to seeing his uh, path forward to that, if that's his proposal on Wednesday night during the State of the State address. Um, I, I agree with President Blair that um, if you're going to do a personal income tax reduction that actually moves the needle and moves people to West Virginia uh, and increases um, likelihood that business you know, looks at West Virginia uh, to locate, uh, I think 50% is that number. But that's a very heavy lift, and um, that's certainly not something that I, I don't believe you're going to do in one year. Now, you know, the, the speaker chooses his words very carefully, and he has a skill that most of us don't have. But, uh, you know, the one to five years is, is probably a fair time frame to, to look at doing something like that. Jason, picking up on that uh, one to five years, as I think I remember being told by Eric and, and others, perhaps yourself, that we have in excess around five to six hundred million dollars a year with our current uh, expenditures. Uh, but yet the 50 percent income tax, you use the term one billion, which would be in excess of the five to six hundred million over a given year. So that would imply that to do the 50% would have to start calling them bone reserves. Am I reading that right? Well, I don't I don't think it's good policy to use reserves. I mean, use reserves for a short-term short-term uh 
shortfall. You, you don't use reserves for a long-term uh, shortfall, which by eliminating 50% of the personal income tax would create a one billion, uh, in, in excess of one billion dollar uh, hole in the state budget every year. And, and you're right, the natural growth in the economy that we've talked about, uh, you know, over the past four years is is roughly 560 to 580 million dollars, 600 million dollars uh, to round up, uh, and that's what we have moving forward. But if you cut 1.1 or 2 uh, billion dollars uh, out of personal income tax, then, you know, then that creates a $500 million hole. So that's not something that I think you fill with reserves. That, that has yeah. to, that's why I'm saying I'm interested to see what the governor's plan is for that. Yeah, that was my point. The, uh, the way as I look at the math, you uh, you have to call upon your reserves, which is something I don't think anyone would be a strong proponent of. Yeah, I, I believe, again, this, these numbers are off the top of my head. I, I believe 50% of personal income tax to be in the $1 billion range, okay. I believe. John, when we talk about the importance of attracting uh, businesses and people into the state, uh, education, every every young parent, you know, any parent wants the best education they can possibly have for their kids. And with the failure of Amendment 4, um, we're still stuck with the problem of, of education. Any plans there? What, how do you see us, us fixing the, the abysmal education numbers we've got? Well, I mean, that's... <laughs> That's certainly, you know, an issue that, that's always going to be, um, you know, at the forefront of the legislative session. And I don't serve on the education committee. I, I did serve uh, my first two years in the House on the education committee, but I don't I don't serve there now. Um, you know, I, I think you look at test scores and I know a lot of folks, you know, don't like to look at test scores. And there's always an excuse why test scores aren't, uh, you know, at satisfactory levels. But again that's the snapshot uh, other than oh, i don't know what else you have uh, to look at to say our students are either performing or they're not performing so um you know i, I think you always want to empower teachers i mean there's there's a, a few things that that i'm sure the education committee is going to look at but um you know we cannot uh, continue to be uh, in the high 40s on education uh, because you can you can have all the tax policy you want you can you can have all the broadband you want but if you don't have an educated workforce you're not going to be able to attract um, the businesses here that you want to attract yeah the the pushback on on the the test scores they don't really mean things or whatever but and that may very well be true I'm not smart enough to know those things but that's what everybody looks at and and it's the same uh, it, it, it's a, the same metric for every other state. So whether it's right. fair or not, everybody else is doing it better. Is it right? Yeah, I, I mean, one of the things that, that I and the, the, the Berkeley County Board of Education had uh, legislators a couple of weeks ago to attend one of their meetings. And, you know, some of the things that I ask about are, are attendance policies. And you know, there's an attendance policy 20 years ago when I was in high school uh, that we refer to as the Z policy. And if you missed a certain amount of time, unexcused absences, you had to make the time up on Saturday. And, you know, I, I think that having uh, accountability to students, having a skin in the game for students, you know, and I think that's one of the, the legitimate arguments with testing is that it doesn't count towards their grade and the students are aware of that and they go in and they don't, you know, the outcome doesn't affect them. So what's the they look at it and say, well, what's the purpose of me giving 100% on this test? And, um, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I think there just has to be, you know, accountability to, to students. And, you know, we have to get out of this mindset. And I think some of this comes from the federal government that um, it's just we, you need to pass students along, whether they're uh, academically worthy of moving to the next grade or not. And I think that's a huge disservice to the student and to, to all of us, frankly. Is this an issue that can be adequately addressed in Charleston? Um, in terms of the education, it's, it seems to me it's a it's a it's as much a local issue as it is a a state issue. I'm trying to think what what string can the legislature pull to to actually improve the education system. Sure. I, I mean, I think it's it's a collective effort. I mean, it's, there's not one thing the legislature is going to do that's going to uh, drastically and, and uh, increase in, in our edu our test scores and quality of education. And I don't think there's one thing the state school board is going to do. You know, clearly that it's the legislature can pass laws, but again, we don't have the rulemaking uh, review uh, authority that we should have over this 
the uh, state school board. So at the end of the day, you know, they're they're kind of in charge. So you know, I, I would look to them to, um, you know, for education policy and and you know, I think the the ownership uh, is really on them, and, and certainly the legislature needs to play a very important and active role in, in, in doing all we can for, for education. Who's your office mate down there, Jason? Uh, Senator Ben Queen. So when you come into, so come into the Senate offices there, we, we each have uh, administrative assistant and then, um, you know, we, we all in the Senate, we have our own office, but, but we're kind of in the same suite. So right. Ben Queen is actually the youngest uh, state Senator uh, at 27, I believe. And so, I think uh, I think I'm fourth, uh, the fourth youngest. I think there are three three senators younger than I am. How, how old were you when you when you won your first election? Uh, Walter Duke, thirty. Thirty. Okay. And Jason, you get uh, credit for your uh, time in the House as far as longevity and for committees and the like. Uh, actually, it's it, seniority doesn't really. Um, I mean, it's it's all at the discretion of the presiding officer. So in the House or the Senate, um, you know, you you um, it's all up to the the presiding officer to decide uh, committee assignments, and you know, they they can base that on seniority if they choose. They can base that on talent if they choose, or or anything they like. So. So the next question then is: Do you have your own place in Charleston in terms of when, where you stay, or do you still do the roomy thing? Uh, with. Uh, uh, summer in Berkeley, we have our own place. So, all right, that's good because you know wives generally don't like roommates around the around the place. Fair point. <laughs> I learned that at a young age. Uh, Jason, thank you very much. Appreciate your time this morning, man. Always a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. All right, you too. Bye. That is Senator Elect, and uh, as of Wednesday, he'll be officially sworn in as Senator Jason Barrett.